I'm very excited for Matt Gordon from, King, from King's College London to be joining me today to talk more about the BI journey at the university. Um, Matt, thank you so much for being here. Uh, could you start by sharing more about King's College and your role? Hi, Lauren. Thanks very much for inviting me. Um, my name is Matt Gordon. I'm the Associate Director for Data and Analytics at King's College Lon London and my job and the job of our team I think has three major elements. The first one is to deliver analysis and information to the senior management team. The second one is to really enhance the general organisational capacity and capability around data and analytics and then the third one is responding to requests from across the university and supporting people from across the university uh, with their data and analytics uh, needs. King's College London is one of uh, the UK's top universities. Uh, we have we have very heavily involved with both research and teaching, having over 30,000 students and delivering uh, world-class research across a number of domains, including uh, health, uh, health and medical research, uh, physical sciences, arts, social sciences. So we are a uh, major and leading university in the UK. That's perfect. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, I'm very excited to dive deeper into a little bit more about your journey. Could you start by telling us a bit about where King's College was before the implementation of Power BI in Azure? Uh, yeah, we really began this uh, journey in 2016. And I guess at that point, I would have described our or, uh, data culture as a sort of hippo culture, that decisions were made on the basis of the highest paid person's opinion, uh, often in very long convoluted meetings, but essentially data was, was not really used uh, often in decision making. I would say we had a culture of data silos where, as one member of staff said, uh, it's quicker to put in a legal freedom of information request to get data out of other departments than just to ask them. And I think as a director of analytics said at one point that really to get data, you needed multiple programming languages to extract it from the systems and a degree in diplomacy to get permission to access that data from whoever owned it and was responsible for it. So a real sort of set of data silos. We also had a lot of data infrastructure issues. So it was quite hard to access the data. When you did get access, you found the data quality was poor. There wasn't really master data across systems. So combining it was difficult and integrating it was difficult. And uh, we had a whole plethora of tools, licenses for all sorts of things like reporting services and Tableau. But the main tool we used for data was Excel, hundreds, thousands, uh, possibly tens of thousands of spreadsheets across the organization. So how did you go about addressing those challenges um, and how did you come to the solution of choosing Power BI? So I think when we looked at it in 2016, we drew up a, a maturity curve to sort of looking at where we were then, which, you know, I identified all of the problems that we had. And even at that point, there were some very good examples, but they were very much one off things where people did a, a detailed piece of analysis, but it wasn't repeatable and wasn't often very reusable. And so we identified that the, the problem and we sort of outlined a sort of roadmap to take us to where we are now, where uh, analytics has become much more strategic. It's much more pervasive across the organization. Uh, and, and really, that's involved a number of steps on, on our sort of, of, of our journey. I think one of the things we've done is we've completely overhauled our approach to the sort of infrastructure for data analytics, and we've moved towards hosting it within Azure. So, as we, so rather than just having lots of separate systems with data exported into Excel, we, we now uh, take the data from those, uh, from those systems using integration services. We load it into uh, our data lake, which at the minute is a Azure Data Lake Gen 1. And we use various things, Data Lake Analytics and Azure Databricks to complete various transformations to that data, including creating deltas for a number of the source systems that didn't have their own deltas. We then load that into a data warehouse, which sits on a, a virtual machine in, in within Azure. And then on top of that, we report over that uh, within Power BI and have a whole number of Power BI reports available within our premium capacity. I should say that looking at this, some of the choices we made 
were ones that happened at the time. So at the time we implemented the data lake, there was only Gen 1 and predominantly data lake analytics. But now we're migrating over towards Azure, Azure Databricks as our preferred solution for that. And, you know, we ended up using virtual machines partly because of the discounts as the higher education that we enjoy for them. Uh, I should say in terms of assessing why we chose Azure, why we chose Power BI, I think two factors predominantly. One, uh, Microsoft was our partner for a whole number of other things already. And secondly, the, the cost proposition around particularly Power BI and uh, Azure more generally was very attractive to us. And that was one of the major factors in us choosing it. I should say, having begun to implement that infrastructure, it's an ongoing project and we're continually adding in new systems and due data domains. This uh, diagram is slightly out of date already and there's another couple of systems that now feed in. And then on top of that, we've implemented a whole range of uh, Power BI reports to enhance the information that's available for our consumers across the organization. And what I'm going to run through here is um, three examples of this. I'm going to show you what we used to do and what the what this now looks like as an alternative. So from our planning model, which we used to plan student numbers, which was an Excel spreadsheet, from um, some HE benchmarking data that we paid for and didn't use, and some examinations reporting around how we assess our students and how people apply some quality assurance to that. So I'll run through the old mod models in a few quick slides, and then I'll flip over to a live demo of some of the Power BI reporting that's available to consumers at King's. So our old Excel model uh, for, for planning student numbers consisted of a spreadsheet or consisted of an annual spreadsheet every year that went through multiple iterations. I think the last one had 80 versions of it that had huge numbers of columns and rows, insane formulas in it, something that was really only uh, understandable to the analyst who looked after it, uh, who was named Ollie. And hence you'll see we refer to the process of using this spreadsheet as Ollification. That it made sense. Uh, to Ollie, but not really to anyone else in the organization. And for senior decision makers, it was incredibly hard to interrogate and get the information they wanted out of that. That's now been replaced in Power BI, which I'll show people. Our exams and assessment process and, and assuring that we were treating all of our students consistently and equitably was left up to individual departments to do. On screen is an example from one of the departments, the informatics department, who uh, being informatics built a bespoke program to deliver it, but all it really produced was uh, a one page slide for each individual module with a couple of charts on. And uh, we are also within the UK able to buy uh, every university in the UK has to submit all of its data uh, or a huge amount of data on its students, its estate, its finances, its research income to, to the regulatory body in the UK, the Higher Education Statistics Authority. And it's possible then to buy back an anonymized data set, not just for your institution, but for every institution in the UK. Incredibly valued, valuable data on our competitors, but we would buy the data every year and then do nothing with it. Okay, I see. So this slide is deliberately left blank to show that even though you were buying that data every year, there was no model that was being created with it. Uh, yes, that's correct. Perfect. Um, and I think that you have cre or prepared a demo for us today. So let's go ahead and dive into that now. Okay. So what I'm going to sort of demonstrate now is what's replaced these three examples uh, within within Power BI. So let me just move over to Power BI. Um, and what uh, every member of staff now at King's ha has a license to view Power BI as part of our premium capacity and can access a range of reports appropriate to their to their uh, to their role and job within our collection of apps here, of which. Uh, you can see there's a whole whole number of them, some of which are useful for specific purposes like planning, some of which are are more niche, uh, like uh, this one, which is built by our uh, sports department that looks after athletics and sports at Kings and exercise, and some of which are appropriate to large numbers of users. So I'm going to show you a few uh, examples of of these, uh, which will hopefully give you a sense of how things have changed. Um, <coughs> 
here we have uh, the replacement for our planning model. Um, I should say all of the examples I'm showing you show contain mock data and not the real data, but um, staff members uh, can now log in who are involved in the planning process setting and setting targets and assessing our performance against them. They can immediately go in and get an overview of uh, reports with which are uh, available at multiple different levels and they can uh, drill down, uh, they can filter for individual years, they can also drill down to different levels and see how we've done over the last few years with real numbers and what the targets are moving forward for a particular area, for a particular course. And this goes from right down from the lowest granularity right up to the, to the organisational level. They can can also compare how they've performed with the target for any given year, how they're performing against that target for student intake. They can see it broken down by various different demographic groups and fee, 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 fee levels and incredibly uh, much richer uh, amount of information for those people who are having to make decisions on whether, uh, on what future targets should be and make financial decisions against how we're performing against our, our current intake target. So really compared to the Excel spreadsheet with its hundreds of rows uh, or thousands of rows and columns, much more accessible, much more usable. Assessments uh, are now replaced this, uh, or let me just replace this with a much more um, uh, comprehensive uh, set of reports. So for each individual module, they have an overview, which gives them both a, a, a written sort of piece of text which uh, gives them an overview of what's happened within that module but also an ability to see how a student's average mark for the year uh, compares to their performance in an individual module broken down by individual all the courses that make it up so they can see if there are particular clusters related to the sort of overarching course the student is doing they can see uh, a demographic breakdown of how uh, people have performed by gender, ethnicity, disability. Uh, they can also see how that's uh, how the module compares to previous years of that module. So whether there's an upward trend in in average mark or a declining trend, and as well as seeing that for an individual module, they can get an overview at a departmental level. So they can see a sort of similar snapshot at uh, departmental level but in this in this instance seeing uh, how uh, it compares uh, for the uh, the module at a course level uh, and whether the, the number of students affects performance on a module they can see the range of marks for modules in a department they can see the demographic information the performance over time they can also see how a particular module performs related, but, you know, compare its standard deviation to other modules within the department, see if there are any particular outliers uh, of individual modules, and they can filter that down and see what those modules might be. And we've also, in this case, deployed the key influencers uh, visual to see what factors encourage uh, students' marks to increase or to decrease. So whether that's combination of particular modules, specific courses, uh, or particular demographic factors, they're able to interrogate that. And I think what we try to aim to do is give people a number of different ways of viewing the same data so they can try and identify things that might be issues for further discussion within departments or amongst those delivering uh, modules to try and really help, help them get a, a number of different interpretations. Benchmarking. Again, we've completely overhauled, so rather than just paying for data and not using it, that the data is now available looking across a range of different uh, different data areas, research, our estates, our finance, our student numbers. And so, for example, here they can look at um, sources of research income. So income comes from for research uh, comes from a number of different funders, including industry or charities or government. And they can see how we compare with other institutions in our peer group, see whether we're getting a, 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 the share we'd expect of that income or not. And they can also uh, look at it via different sort of cost centers so of different, different subject areas and look at a range of different over the course of different years and see how that changes really to help those looking for research income identify where we might not be maximizing it uh, and where there might be opportunities to get uh, to get more income in around research and we've also gone on uh, to 
uh, deploy, um, as I showed you one example of where we deployed the key influences visual, but we've now also deployed that across a number, we've deployed that and other AI visuals across a number of our different reports. And again, I, what I'd say is that in doing this, we've tried to deploy this not as a solution in itself, but as another lens on the data we're already we're already giving people. So as well as sort of trend data and comparative data, we've also tried to deploy the key influences visual. And this one particularly looks at what uh, influences staff members to be at a specific grade, whether that's our sort of professional services and administrative staff, or whether that's our teaching staff, and to see what what leads, what factors might influence staff members to be graded at, di at different grades. And this has proved incredibly important and useful as, as an institution as we've tried to address the how we should respond to the the black lives matter movement and this has been discussed quite extensively and these particular visuals have been discussed quite extensively uh, as factors that tend to influence and that might need more consideration and us to address uh, issues it's not necessarily revealed issues that weren't known to people, but it has reinforced that the that certain things are uh, ongoing issues and ongoing areas of concern. And so, as well as the visual, we've also deployed the decomposition tree in a number of reports. This is one that looks at the recovery of research overhead. So, as part of research grants, uh, they include a greater or lesser amount of overheads to uh, help pay for the things that aren't directly related to the research. So someone needs to pay for the uh, HR team to advertise the research assistance jobs, for example. And so there is an amount of overheads which is, which goes into that, that sort of general cost that doesn't directly relate to the, in, to the research done by the uh, academic or the researchers, but actually contributes towards that. And obviously recovering that cost is very important. And we 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 try to make sure we uh, recover that as much as possible. And this is a uh, this gives us the lens on which departments, which areas, which budget holders are being particularly effective uh, at recovering those overheads. And again, it's part of a more general piece of analysis, which gives a number of traditional tables, year-on-year -year views, a Pareto analysis. But it helps offer offer people another lens on that view. We've also deployed the decomposition tree to look at uh, credit card spend and, not, uh, and purchasing card spend. And again, it's part of a, this was traditionally done by uh, our audit team getting an Excel spreadsheet of all of the uh, credit card spend for the year and trying to wade through it line by line and maybe putting it into a pivot table, but a fairly uh, manual process. And we've now put it into uh, into a, into a, a number of different uh, pieces of analysis, but including a decomposition tree, so people can see where spend is verified or not spend, receipted or not re not receipted, and begin to to look at it in, in in different ways, hoping to give people those those lenses. And we've sort of encouraged our analysts to try the various AI visuals in 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 the reports they're putting together, see if they offer another lens on the on the data, another another way to get value out of it. And if they do, we've we, we've moved them in into production. If they don't, we've not. Hmm. So Matt, thank you so much for that demonstration and, and view into some of the reports that you've put together. Um, I love how cohesive everything is across the board. And I, I especially love the examples of the AI that you were sharing. Um, and before we get into the how we got here, I'm, I'm curious. So when it comes to creating the reports, what's the balance between reports being centrally created by some sort of IT team and self-service? So uh, we have a very mixed economy. So the central analytics team it delivers reports that are aimed at the senior management and are supporting strategic decisions. And we also will tend to produce reports for areas that have a large number of, or a large volume of users and have a consistent process across the organization. So examinations being an example, but we've also really tried to encourage and empower people at all levels to, to try and get value out of their data. So we have a number of reports where 
people can filter down within Power BI itself to get data that's relevant to them. And we also uh, have made Power BI Desktop available with our, in our in, internal software center. And anyone can download that and plug their data in, in, into the desktop and get value out of it. And assuming they agree to various uh, terms and conditions around appropriate use and data protection, they can get a Power BI Pro license and publish that up into the service and, and share it with other staff members. Um, we try to encourage people to get as much value out of their data as possible. And with the best will in the world, a small central team is never going to get around to some areas of data that people have locally, but where there is value for them by putting it in Power BI and sharing it with their immediate colleagues and, uh, and managers. So we, we, we operate a very mixed approach to this and try and help people get what value they can. And as a central team, we run regular training to people who want to use Power BI Desktop to build their reports. And we run regular drop-in sessions so that if they hit a problem or want to ask for some advice around something that we're, they can access a, a member of the analytics team centrally who will be able to help them work through their individual problem. Yeah, that sounds great, and it, and it makes a lot of sense. Um, so I know that a journey to a successful new technology will always incorporate a lot of different factors. So what are some of the things that have helped you get to where King's College is today? Um, I think, firstly, I, I'd say we've had good support from the senior leadership team and the senior management. Uh, around 2016, they made a very clear decision that, um, that they needed data uh, and uh, an analysis in order to make better decisions and that they just didn't have access to the data they needed to make decisions. So they made a choice to it, to it, to invest in both the team and the infrastructure around data. I think we've also been very lucky that we have a number of senior leaders who actively use data to inform their decisions and actively engage with Power BI and the dashboards and reports and we'll bring them up in meetings and use them in meetings actively to help inform their decisions. As I said, we've tried really to empower users at all levels. So uh, everyone has access to Power BI. We try to encourage them and train them in how to use Power BI, the Power BI service. And if they want to, to use the desktop to build more reports. We run regular training in both where well, we have online recordings and training on how to use Power BI service and in how to use uh, Power BI desktop. And we've replaced lots of our what was more face-to-face -face offerings obviously over the last uh, six months with, uh, with a whole suite of online uh, courses and training. We also have run over the last few years regular hackathons where we've encouraged people to bring along data that was sort of in spreadsheets uh, and that we've tried to wrangle that into a useful Power BI reports and dashboards to help those areas. And it's also helped us identify potential new projects and new areas to support. And that's resulted in a number of very successful things. So one resulted in our sustainability team being able to uh, really improve our waste recycling and deliver real cost savings around uh, waste uh, recycling and waste management. Um, We've tried to build up the central team as a sort of centre for excellence that can both support the senior management's requirements, but also empower and train others uh, in the organisation. It brings together both sort of the analysts of the data, but also the, the developers who are working in Azure to create that infrastructure within the data lake and within the, in the data warehouse. So it's a sort of end-to-end team really that can take data from source systems and uh, visualize and analyze that data within uh, Power BI. And what that's seen across the organization is a real growth within Power BI, both in terms of the number of users and in terms of the, the, the views that individual reports are getting. Uh, and I think you can see that here, which looks at the sort of view workspaces by viewers and, uh, and users, but there's still a lot of work to be done to begin to continually expand that, 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 ba that, that, that base of users and encourage more people to take advantage of, 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 of the data that, that is available. But it has had a real impact within the organization. I think it's helped create a, 
a shared understanding of the challenges we face what our object clarity on what our objectives are as an organization you know a common language around it it's helped us to dispel those organizational myths which exist within an organization but aren't necessarily supported by the data it's helped us uh, address questions of equity and diversity by making clear what our our current situation is it's helped with innovation it's allowed people access to data to to understand where there might be opportunities to run new courses where there might be a market for new courses and where there might be uh, research income available or where we could potentially gain additional research income it's also helped to have difficult conversations because at least everyone is operating off a common framework of data and able to see the same data uh, to inform those 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 conversations um, I'd be honest and say uh, every time uh, I, I'm working I think there's still a huge amount to do so while I think we've made an incredible amount of progress we still have a huge amount of, of work we still have very uneven uptake across the organization both within between departments and faculties you know there are really different levels of uptakes but even within departments and faculties some users are much more engaged in it and we have to work continually to try and encourage and engage and communicate to people what is available and how to use it access to the data sources can still be very challenging I think data literacy becomes a bigger challenge the more we push data out there people understanding uh, how to interpret the, the the information that's out there what decisions can and can't be informed by that data and I think one of the bigger ones for us over the next years is building on what we've done with the AI visuals but beginning to build a real capacity internally for data science and machine learning to really get more uh, insight out of our data um, one of the things we did as part of our journey was we found a partner because when we started it in 2016 we didn't really feel we had particularly with the Azure infrastructure have a lot of uh, expertise and capacity in it uh, internally or the expertise to use it and the capacity to build that we didn't really feel we, we had so we found a partner in this case a Datis who were a Microsoft Gold partner who we worked with extensively around the, the, the around the, the building of the sort of data lake infrastructure and the data warehouse and that's proved to be an incredibly fruitful partnership for us and um, one of the things that they were particularly willing to do and were good at was when we said to them and actually as our partners we want you to build that internal capacity so you you become we become less dependent on you and they've been incredibly willing uh, to do that so we're uh, our current set of development sprints for the warehouse uh, are being delivered completely with internal capacity the other thing that I think we've learned and the main thing I think we've learned is that transforming an organization's capacity around data and analytics is really about changing the culture of the organization much more than it's a technical project it's a cultural change project and that means communications become incredibly important for the organization so we've produced a whole number of different ways of communicating with people whole numbers of briefing sessions monthly calls to outline what's new what's happening emails the digest that go out collateral to make sure people know what's available and it's a continual process of cultural change uh, and if anyone would like to talk to me more about it, here are my contact details. That's perfect. Thank you so much, Matt. This has been honestly so interesting to go through your journey and what King's College has been through. And I, I really appreciate your time and putting all of this information together and in sharing it with me today. Thank you. It's been my pleasure.